thanks a lot for coming. This is the fourth Manchester threat. And we've got Stu Cox here tonight from Modernizer. I'm just going to quickly go over the sponsors. So, coming to our uh, thread is uh, something that we've set up. There's a thread in the States as well. And it's basically just to get front end developers together, talk about all the latest things that are happening, and collaborate and help each other out within the web community. Um, Tech Hub, Doug said tonight, so thanks to Doug for you know, providing the space and pizzas and beer. Does an awesome job. So thanks very much. Uh, Absolute is where I work and they've donated some money tonight to help cover the costs of like travel expenses and filming today. Um, also using digital who have helped with that and three quarters production. So uh, Chris is at the back filming. So if you need any filming or anything like that, recommend Chris Top Um So thanks very much to the sponsors. So just briefly go over um, first of all first commit was done by Paul Ice and that was four years ago. Um, so it's all on GitHub. Um, is anyone like following it on GitHub? So if you if you've come to uh, previous Manchester threads and things like that, one of the things that I love to do and where you can really learn from is just following the commits and comments and things like that on, on GitHub. And I really encourage you to just you know, if you can do a pull request and try and contribute to things. Even if you know like, you're not quite sure, do it anyway, because you can always get even if it's not going to get pulled in it's really rewarding to see like people commenting back and just letting you know like where you've gone wrong or how you can you know maybe improve it and it's great if you obviously then it does get pulled in. Um, so key players, I'm not going to try and pronounce all the names, read them. But also uh, these slides will be available and you can click the links and obviously like read up and find out more about them who just did that. And there's also some really good uh, resources on the web to find out and again I've put them there. And this is all going to be recorded so this will be on the internet, and that's about it. So, thanks very much. I'll hand you over to Stu. Cheers. <laughs> um, yeah, so, this is your bit where I have to switch up from one side, so bear with me a second. Um, so, yeah, um, I think this talks to me about a little bit more than just modernizer because um, it kind of needs a bit of context, really, and um, there's only so much I can talk about the code base of modernizer itself. Um, but essentially modernizer and terms like progressive enhancement and responsive design, uh, mobile first, these are all kind of terms and, and, and ideas that are all, all about compatibility. Okay, so it's all about whatever you're building working across a number of different platforms, a number of different devices, and for various different users. So there's kind of like an accessibility side to it all as well. Because um, this is a talk, kind of be the dictionary definition, apparently. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, so it, when I'm talking about compatibility here, I'm talking about basically getting your app or your web. I like to get the term web thing rather than app or site because it's just nice and you know, doesn't really try and find them down too much. Um, basically, just trying to get that work with, make sure that fits nicely with, however. Um, your user is, is accessing your, your app or your website. Um, so, a little bit of history, and some of you will remember some of, some of this. Um, if any of you guys don't remember this, then you're very, very lucky. Um, we used to make a thing, make it look really pretty, and we test it in our chosen browser. Obviously, I'm just picking the browser around the obviously. Um, and you go, way, way, it works, brilliant. Um, you then try it in another browser, again, I'm just, <laughs> just picking them at random, um, and it wouldn't work. So you'd have things like your, your bit of media, instead of having a nice video, you'd have a white box with a cross in it, and your buttons being in the wrong places, and your columns at the bottom would line up, and things like that. So you'd then hack the life out of it. Um, there, are, there are so many websites dedicated to CSS hacks, it makes me feel a little bit ill to even talk about it. Um, these little things of, oh yeah, this browser will pass this, this one won't, and so on, so you can use that to target specific browsers. Or a JavaScript, quite common to use user agent snips. So every browser says, this is the browser that I'm called, and you can try and run a regular expression over that to try and work out if it's the one you, you try and target. Um, all of these are heuristics. So you're kind of looking at one thing when really what, you, what you're interested in is another. You, you're not interested in, does it pass, you know, does the browser pass a CSS rule which starts with a star? You're interested in, 
has it broken my layout? You want to know it. It's a much better idea to focus on why your layout's broken rather than just, oh, it looks different in this browser, I'll nudge it. Um, so, heuristics just imply assumptions, and you know, there's the old adage assumption is the mother of all fuck ups, and it's completely true. Every time you make an assumption, there is something that can and probably will at some point in the future slip through the net. Um, so, the example the heuristics we and assumptions we were making just there were that browsers that pass a certain hack in a certain way would also have a certain layout bug. Things that a browser that matches a certain uh, user agent stream would also support a certain feature. Um, you might say, okay, I, I know all the browsers that my, that my, um, my users are using. Um, do you really? Have you really thought about that in the future as well? Um, and the answer is probably not because we can't all predict the future, basically. So, um, even if you do think you know about every single browser, I did a quick check on using Can I Use, because it summarizes the stats quite nicely. Um, at the moment, there are 85 browser versions which have got more than a 0.1% um, market share, which um, is a lot. And Facebook claim that they see 7,000 different devices every single day. So if you, even if, even if that was the limited set that you had to work with and you didn't have to think about the future, that's a huge number of different options that you have to test and work through. And also then you've got accessibility and different users on top of that as well. So it all becomes quite unmanageable quite quickly. Um, so we just kind of go back to, if we've got two browsers, why are there differences between them? Um, there are actually three sources of compatibility problems in my opinion. Features, plugins, and bugs, and differences those makes unhappy. Um, <laughs> sorry, just a bit fun. Um, so examples of features. So these are kind of things that are in the specs. And there might be CSS features, things like font face and all sorts of like nice shiny things that we want to use in HTML. So we now have native audio, native video, um, drag and drop, JavaScript stuff. So there are a whole whole new load of APIs in HTML5 and so on. So that, that I kind of class those as the features. Then from the plugin side, Flash, Silverlight, Java, all that kind of stuff, you never really know whether they're installed just by kind of guessing. We can't, we certainly can't assume everyone's got Flash anymore, because Apple devices don't let you do it. Good problem for that. Um, and then bugs are the classic IE6 rendering bugs, and other things like um, Android, early Android devices, and in fact the one in my pocket has got a huge number of bugs in various different places. Um, and I like to kind of group these three things together. And I say capabilities, because I think this kind of really helps us if we try and think of them all in the same way. Um, features are obviously a capability of the browser. Plugins add capabilities. Occasionally they take them away, but most of the time they add them. And then bugs are in capabilities. So if we start thinking of it in terms of, instead of it's, oh, you know, this browser's got this bug. Um, what, we're, what we're really interested in is we want rely on the fact that other browsers don't have that bug. Um, and I'll show you why that's a useful way of thinking about it. So this is just a kind of quote that I, I, I don't know if it's entirely true, but I like to sort of think, think in this way, which is that the differences between two users of browsers can entirely be described by the differences between their capability sets. Um, so, progressive enhancement. Where does this all fit in? Progressive enhancement is about providing different experiences for different users, depending on their capabilities. You've probably heard all sorts of um, uh, analogies for progressive enhancement, like the, an escalator, when the, the electricity dies, it's still a set of stairs. That's great. Um, and then loads of, loads of people also talk about, okay, so if it's progressively enhanced, then it should work without JavaScript. I think. That's all kind of a slightly old way of looking at it now, even though progressive enhancement has only been around for a few years. Really, it's simply about providing different things for different users who can experience it. So, I like to think of anything that we're building on the web as just a collection of features. Okay. There's the core, there's the things that every single user needs. And when I say every user, I mean every user. Okay. So, that includes users who have sight impairments. It, it includes users who... <coughs> Who might be trying to um, just scrape scrape the data by you know for, for some other service? There are so many different kinds of users that might be inter 
contracting with your app. And it's, this is literally the, the essential bits. And then anything else is an enhancement. Okay? And as I say, the core is smaller than you think. It is the absolute minimum required for whatever you're building to have any meaning. Um, and this is kind of where the capabilities come back in. So we can say that there are core capabilities. These are the things that are required in order for it to function at a basic level. Um, the fewer capabilities your core requires, the more users in total can make use of your app. Um, so if you're, the only capability you require is the ability to render HTML, then great. I think you can assume that every web-connected device will, um, certainly this decade. <laughs> if not, then. Um, and then everything else is an enhancement capability. They're capabilities that will, that if a user has them, then we can rely on them to make our enhancements and give them a fuller and richer experience. Um, so, just kind of some examples of enhancement. Basically, any styling I consider to be some kind of enhancement. Okay, if you've got a user who is blind, then they can't experience your styling whatsoever. Um, so, if you can, if your if your your styling was part of your core, then you're going to start alienating those users. Also, you've got things like fonts, animations, all these kind of nice, lovely things that we like to put in. Even a background image might just be nice to have. Um, or it could be a whole functional part. So I've given the example of a chat feature here. Um, in Facebook, you know, they've got their messaging system, and then there's also the instant chat. If instant chat didn't work, it's fine, you can still use the messaging. It's kind of an enhancement, right? So if, um, if a particular user's browser didn't have the capabilities to run that chat feature, just don't give us a fine, they can still get on with that too. Um, this is where I kind of start delving into my own terminology for a lot of things. So I like to think of think about atomic enhancements. Okay? And by that I mean that this enhan any enhancement is either applied fully or not at all. Okay? It degrades gracefully. I think graceful degradation, as is probably a term a lot of you might have heard, that is kind of considered a dirty word because people used it to just kind of I don't know, sweep things under the carpet. But I actually think it's quite a useful term. It basically says that when capabilities aren't available, we still want it to work and we don't want it to impede the user. If an enhancement isn't atomic, then bad things happen, basically. So you end up with broken layouts, you get JavaScript errors, things go, things go bad, and they, they go bad for the user, but it affects the user, it gets in their way. Um, so here's kind of a, a simple example of um, something that won't degrade gracefully. So this is a non-atomic enhancement. We basically decided for this particular module, we're going to start using box sizing. I don't know how good your CSS knowledge is, but this basically changes the way that the box model works for laying it out. We've then used some, some styling based, based on that assumption that we're using this box, box sizing board box. Now if box sizing isn't, isn't supported, this layout's going to go funny. Similarly, in JavaScript, if you try and use a function that isn't supported in the browser, then it's going to throw an error. That's going to cause other code not to run. You've got a, it's, again, it's, a, it's not an, a, an atomic enhancement. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that the enhancements that we add, add to our core are atomic. They're either there so that a user whose browser can deal with it sees it, or we don't want it, you know, we don't want it to get in the way and cause problems for those browsers. For those users who haven't got that. So three ways to do that. You either start avoiding dependencies, i.e. not using nice new shiny browser features. Now that's a bit of a Luddite way to do it. We want to be using this stuff and people who are who are getting the latest devices and upgrading their browser, they should be they should be getting rich experience experiences. You can also put in safety nets. These are quite difficult to make work a lot of the time, but essentially having something that will just happen to fall back nicely when you put something in place. Or there's feature, feature detection, which is obviously what Modernizer is all about and what the rest of this talk is going to be about really. So feature detection, if you haven't heard this term before, is testing if browser offers certain capabilities. The basic pattern that you might follow in JavaScript will be, if I have this, this feature, then implement something. I can then implement my entire um, enhancement here, otherwise provide some kind of fallback if we decide that's a good idea. These are some of the techniques that are used. Um, I think particularly when people start using Modernizer, they kind of think of um, 
the way the feature detection is done is kind of possibly a bit of a, a black art. Uh, it's not, so it's actually surprisingly simple. So one of the basic ones we use is the geolocation. We just literally just see if there's a geolocation object on the navigation object. Does it stick is kind of um, mostly for styling. So all browsers, if if they don't support a particular style value that you try and apply, um, then when you try and set it, if you read it back, it won't, it won't, it won't stay there as a value. So this is what we do for filter. We try and set the filter, and then we basically check that there is actually still a value, still a style value there. And then the next step, which is kind of a bit further on, is does it work? So we actually try and use it. Now, the, the general plan, and I'll go into, this, go into a bit more detail about this, is if we can do a really, really quick detect, and that works in every browser we know about, great, we've won. If, and there are certain browsers that will look like they, they've got an API, but it doesn't actually work. Unfortunately, Chrome is actually the worst for that, surprisingly. Um, we have to do a slightly more involved test, and then these kind of actually testing it in full uh, cases, we resort to if we have to. That's the only way to do it. Um, but they're slower. We don't want slow detect because only you detect the start of the page, it slows down the page rendering and things like that. Media queries, um, to me, that's another kind of feature to detect. Um, so, in the world of responsive design, I'm sure a lot of you would come across media queries. You basically, you basically have querying um, features of the viewport or fe features of, of the device screen, um, and you can do that in JavaScript as well. And yeah, that's another kind of feature to detect. There's also now native detection. This is only in a couple of browsers. Um, it's in Firefox Nightly, it's in Opera, and it's in Chrome um, Canary. But Firefox and Chrome will both be rolling that out into their stable versions uh, in the next few months. Which basically, so at the moment, it's only a CSS feature, but it, it essentially allows you to say, if I was to try and use this particular style, would it work? Do you understand it? Which is, this is kind of quite a major step for us. Um, Paul Irish, who's also in the Modernizer team, is actually the guy who proposed this. Um, we also want a similar pattern for JavaScript, um, because browsers should be telling us what they do in those support. But um, work on that is still taking quite a long time, and a lot of people are arguing about a lot of things. Um, but it's the first time we've had a real contract of you know, the browser having to tell us whether they genuinely support something. I think it's quite a big step. Um, so I mentioned fallbacks earlier. To me, there are three kinds of fallback. There's not providing a fallback, which, if you can get away with that, is always preferable because it's the most lightweight way to do it. It's easy to maintain, and it, it fits the pattern of you get an enhancement if, there, if you have the capabilities, and if not, then you don't, and it's fine. You can just deal with the core features of the app. Um, there's also replacing functionality, so this normally requires quite a lot of heavy JavaScript, uh, depending on what it is you're replacing. Um, I think that there was a point at which everyone is polyfill everything, and there are polyfills for so many HTML5 and CSS3 things that um, it's astounding what people have come up with, but ultimately you're trying to get potentially an older, less efficient browser to do even more work just to look a bit prettier half the time. So generally, um, I, I, I avoid polyfills wherever possible. Um, I know a lot of our other developers do the same. Um, but occasionally, it's necessary. Um, and then there's providing alternative functionality, which I call sandwich filling. You're just kind of stuffing something in there so that it gives it a bit more bulk for the sake of it. And that's, I try and avoid that at all costs, unless clients are absolutely desperate just to have an alternative that looks a bit prettier. Um, so, on to Modernizer then. Um, it's basically just a feature detection library. We've taken all of the feature detects we can find from, uh, from various different uh, places, uh, loads, loads and loads of contrib contributors from around the world, um, all using the kind of techniques that I've suggested earlier. Some of them are much more involved, some of them are, you know, just those kind of simple one-liners, and we put them into a library so you, there's one place to go to get all these things. Um, it also adds some, some niceness to working with feature detection. So it presents a load of Boolean va values on the modernizer object, so testing for things is really, really easy. You don't need to remember what the feature detect is. 
just use ours, just get on with it, it's easy. Again, fallback's always optional. And um, it also adds classes to the HTML tag um, in your document. So it'll add both uh, a yes and a no with the case, basically. So here we've got geolocation as a class and no geolocation as a class, depending on the result. Um, that makes it quite easy because although you might be detecting some, a JavaScript feature, it may be, so if, in this case with geolocation, it may be that if the user isn't able, if the user's browser isn't able to report its location, then actually our layout might have to be different because there may, might be a part of our app that we need to hide. Something like that. Um, it's got a custom builder, so that in, in my opinion, this is actually the, the best bit of it is the fact that you can and you should just select the bits that you need. Um, there's a modernized dev version at the moment, um, which includes a handful of what we kind of call the, the core detects. Um, but it's a really bad idea to put that in production because it's big, it's slow, um, it's doing loads of stuff that you don't need. So fine for real development, but once you actually get into serious production, use, a, use the custom build system. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about the future of that in a second. Um, Modernizer also allows you to add your own tests, so if they decided to add a Yoda element to the W3 specs, who knows, um, then that might be a feature to tap for it. You could just add that yourself, so that both means that you don't necessarily have to wait for us to include it in Modernizer, but it also means that if you have something that might not strictly be a normal feature to tap, or might not be something that you think other people would be interested in, it might be quite specific to your app. You can still add that in, and then you still have the same benefits of just being able to test it as a boolean, but also getting the class sectional. So that's always really useful. Um, there's conditional loading, which we use via um, a library called YetNote, um, which is written by one of the other guys on the team, Alex Hexton, um, who rarely sleeps. <laughs> um, but essentially, um, so that this this is particularly useful. <coughs> either the code that you're planning to, the plans to use certain capabilities is quite heavy, or if you are using a polyfill, and obviously you only want to load that heavy polyfill code if that that feature isn't detected. So um, it's nice to have it in there as part of the modernizer, um, part of the modernizer library. It's an optional build uh, build feature as well, or you can just grab yet note from from GitHub and use that individually if you like. So Modernizer 3.0 is uh, what we're working on at the moment. Um, previous version was 2.6.2. Unfortunately, it's been quite a long time since that, and we're not able to do another 2.6 release for various technical reasons, mostly because we merged into master too early for that. Um, and, but so all of our efforts going into this, and it, it is quite a big leap for us. So um, the entire internal architecture of Modernizer has changed. We're now following an A and B structure, so for, for those of you who don't know what that is, um, we're using a specific mod module format that manages dependencies, and it essentially, for each detect, we're able to say what its dependencies are. And what that means is we don't have a kind of bulk core that you need in order to build, in order to create a modernized build. Um, when you use the, the builder to select the, the bits that you want, everything that gets compiled in is the absolute minimum required to make that work, which is brilliant. So builds have got lots more. It depends how many detects you're including, but for most of the builds I've done recently, it's been about 60% smaller, which makes a real difference. Um, we've got a load more detects that unfortunately we weren't able to release as a 2.6 um, release. We've fixed loads of bugs. Um, we've got a new feature, which is modernizer.on um, for handling asynchronous tests. So some of the tests, they take a bit of asynchronous action. Um, much easier to handle, handle with uh, modernizer on. Um, there's a polyfill for, for that actually on my GitHub, which I'm meant to mention on there, but I didn't. Um, GitHub.com forward slash Jukox. There's a you can you can use modernizer on with a 2.2.6 build. Um, and we're also now using the app supports um, rule uh, under the hood when available. Um, so I, I was talking about that earlier. That this is the the contract which the browser makes that says, you know. If you ask me if I support a the thing, then I'm, I'm only allowed to say yes if I really do support it. And the community is going to be getting seriously heavy-handed with browser vendors if they don't 
stick to that contract. So we believe that that's going to be the future and actually will eventually probably mean the end of modernizer, which is a good thing. There's one less library you have to you have to, to use than, than that would be a good thing. But in the meantime, if it's there, we'll make use of it for much more reliable protection. If it isn't, then we'll stick to our user patterns. Um, we're also going to be moving to a much faster release cycle. Um, it's likely that when Modernizer 3 launches, from that point onwards, our builder will be linked to the master branch in our repo. So as soon as bug fixes, new detects and so on are rolled in, they'll be available on the website straight away, which I think is really, really good. Um, and it was actually probably one of the failures of the previous version was that things weren't fast enough. And because of the restructuring, it's, met, restructuring, it's making, us, making it a lot easier for us to write decent documentation and have documentation for every single detect. Um, <coughs> any of you guys <coughs> in Angry and you use the Grunt build tool, then check out Grunt Modernizer. Um, it's already, already available for 2.6.2, but um, it's going to be updated for, for version, well, it has already been updated for version 3 as well. Um, so it's using that dependency tracking goodness to be able to um, pull in a really, really small build and make it really, really easy to work, work with. Um, I'll give you the link to these slides at the end, but um, it's also worth checking out Alex Sexton's uh, slides about Modernizer 3. In fact, I think they were linked on, linked on your slides, weren't they? Um, so he's kind of talked about a bit more about how he personally would use Modernizer 3 in a, a proper project workflow. Um, and yeah, it's a good slide there. Um, right, so I didn't bother doing any slides for this bit because I left it too late to write them in the first place. Um, but yeah, so Simon asked me to talk a bit about how I'm involved in Modernizer, how I got involved in Modernizer. So at any point, just, just shout out any questions if you've got them uh, at this point. So I think it's probably worth saying that I started off just by following him on, 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 on GitHub, as Simon was saying. It's a really, really useful thing to do. You then get notified of all the changes that go on, you get a feel for it. The reason that I did that was because I just wanted to know about some of the new things that were happening. Um, some of the, the first times at which I, I hear of new features that are coming into browsers are when the browser vendors submit pull requests to Modernizer for the text for the features that they've literally just written their C++ code for in the browser. So that, that happens about once a week, we'll get, we'll get one of the browser developers actually submit Many these things saying we've just implemented this, we, we want to detect the modernizer. So that was kind of how I got it, how I started getting involved. So I was just keeping an eye on it. Every now and again I'd see a bug or someone would mention a bug and I'd submit a pull request or something like that. Um, I started getting more involved when there were a lot of discussions around modernizer.touch. So this is one of one of the detects is called touch and it was originally supposed to detect um, touchscreen capability. So is this a touchscreen device? Now, it turns out that's a very, very difficult thing to detect accurately. And as time went on, we kind of realized that the detect and modernizer wasn't really doing its job. There were too many false positives, too many false negatives. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more separately in a minute. But I got involved in those conversations and said a few things, basically saying modernizer isn't in a place to be able to detect touch devices and actually is in, not really in a place because of the JavaScript environment to detect uh, many device features at all. Um, actually a very, very small amount of information is provided to the, the browser and the document environment about the device. Um, so there are a number of kind of statements and kind of backwards and forwards discussions and the guys on the scene seem to like what I was saying. So ended up talking to them a bit more, and um, and yeah, then got an email from Paul Irish saying, "Would you like to be a be a core, core team member?" So yeah, I got involved, and since then I've been doing a few hours a week on Modernizer. So keeping an eye on tickets, um, the app support feature that I said is, is in Modernizer um, version three. Us, us using that behind the scenes, I wrote all of that. Um, I also just make tweets to tickets here and there, doing bits of documentation, um, adding new texts if I think of them, all this kind of stuff. 
So yeah, and we we have we try and keep most of our discussions public on GitHub because we think that's a really good thing. Occasionally, there's there's when we sort of feel that we need a consensus, we'll have a discussion offline, and then we'll we'll uh, go back on, on to GitHub to, to talk about that. So getting involved in that kind of stuff as well has been really good. And yeah, in uh, March I went out to um, Texas for South by Southwest and met the other guys on the team. So I met Farouk Atesh, who started the project, although I don't think he's ever written a line of code for it, but it was a nice idea, why don't we? Um, <laughs> no, he, he manages the project really well and um, has a, a really solid vision for it. Paul Irish, who, as you say, did the first commit and is the lead developer, um, and I'm sure you guys know from all sorts of other things, it's amazing how much stuff he gets involved in. And Alex Hexton as well, who's a top guy, did all the get note stuff. He tends to do a lot of the kind of behind the scenes infrastructure stuff on Modernizer. Um, but yeah, I got to meet all of them, and that was really, really good. I also met a guy called Chris Rupal, who is responsible for the Modernizer module in Drupal. It's just a just coincidence that his surname rhymes with Drupal. Um, but yeah, met those guys out there, and yeah, that was really, really good. Um, in terms of working on Modernizer as a kind of a large project, I don't think of it as a large project. So I think we're on, I think we've got something like 850,000 deployments at the moment. Um, that many projects, and that includes Google, um, it includes Microsoft, um, it includes a huge number of different websites. We believe Facebook copy architects out and use them internally, but they'd never allow it allow the modernizer, the, the modernizer global object to become visible on their website, of course. Um, things like that. But um, So it's used all over the place, but still, it's actually quite a small code base. That's by design. We want it to be as small as possible. Every detect should be as small and efficient as possible. Um, but yeah, and all the time, I guess you just kind of know that as, you, as, as you're working on this, there are a lot of people who are interested in what you're doing. A lot of people have a lot of say into it, we get pull requests from all sorts of different people. Um, some some of them have only been writing code for three weeks or something and they just go, oh, I've found this one nice thing, oh, it's quite good, I want this. And then they'll, they'll throw out a pull request and that's great. Um, Simon was saying earlier about, um, you know, it's worth submitting the pull request, whether or not it gets, gets accepted. I think um, probably 95 plus percent of the pull, pull requests we get Get it, do get accepted, possibly after a bit of tweaking, but nearly all of them do get in. Um, so, yeah, it's totally worth getting involved um, because it's a project that is relevant to so many people that, you know, we, we do have a lot of input from a huge number of people, and that's a really, really good thing about it. So, um, on, on that stuff, I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Anyone wants to throw anything out there? Or? Just ask how many people are actually using Modernizer today? I pretty much everyone there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you find it? Like implementing it, things like that? Or something like books you found anything? No books, it's an absolute gun. <laughs> 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 do you want to have a rant about anything? <laughs> <laughs> Does it work if JavaScript is disabled? No. It's, it's pure pure JavaScript library. Um, what, what you do get out of, out of it though is if you follow um, the kind of standard pattern we tend to recommend of having a no hyphen JS class on your HTML element, um, then we will then replace it. So Modernizer actually just re replaces that with a, a JS class. So that at least gives you, within, within your style sheet, it gives you a way of knowing whether or not JavaScript is enabled. It's a thing that Paul Irish wrote about conditional classes. Where yeah. the text for like I different versions of IE as well, so you can specify the IE and within that you just got the JS there Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it, this kind of goes back to the, the capabilities and dependencies thing I was talking about. So if you are using, as soon as you decide to use modernizer to, to detect something, and just, as soon as you decide to use feature detection, you're sort of inherently adding JavaScript as another dependency. It's another capability that you're depending on for your feature. Um, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a bad idea for the core of your app to, re to require JavaScript. I think nowadays 
we're at a point where people who don't enable JavaScript know that most of the internet can work for them. Um, there's something that, um, along those lines, that Carl Simpson said in a talk I saw a while ago, um, the guy that wrote one of the intro introductory to HTML5 books, um, where he basically it, it's talking about non-JS users and talking about IE6 users and IE7 users. These people know that most of the internet doesn't work with what they're using. Um, there's only so much point in trying to give them an amazing experience. You're not going to get a letter from them saying thank you. Um, <laughs> that, that said, that said, there are a huge number of reasons why it is very useful to have a site that presents some content when JavaScript isn't enabled. Like I say, there's crawls, there's SEO, um, there's accessibility, although I think you'd be hard to push to find a screen reader in wide use at the moment that doesn't run JavaScript. Um, but all of, the, all of these things, I think it's about knowing your audience and knowing what capability is acceptable for, for your app to depend on. And you can determine that on a feature by feature basis and for your core as well. So, yeah, um, I'll carry on a little bit there. Um, an interesting thing we come across quite a lot, particularly in the modernized, because most people want to set everything under the sun. The undetectables. There's a page on the modernizer wiki about this, um, which kind of gives some examples. But I thought we've never kind of described why certain things are undetectable, so I thought I'd go through that now. Um, for a root, something that we consider to be a good root to detect should both be <coughs> the positives right and the negatives. Um, there's some benefit in, in kind of having a bit of an unknown. If you say, right, I know that this has definitely got this capability, but I don't know about this, this, particular, uh, this particular case. Um, I think there are one or two in, in Modernizer which will actually return undefined um, rather than ever, rather than ever, ever actually given false. Um, but ideally, we want to know by the cases reliably. We want it to be lightweight, we want it to be small and fast. Again, that's kind of down to how accurately we can do everything. We also don't want to make assumptions, this is what I was saying earlier, but realistically, just about every detect does make some kind of assumption. Um, I'll give some examples of that in a minute. So, rule one, if you know, you're trying to come up with a, a feature detect or something, is whatever it is you're trying to detect must interact with the document. We're, we're in JavaScript here, we only get what we get told. We only have access to what we get told by the browser. Um, so, in terms of styling, all of the styling detects are actually heuristics in, in some way. Okay. So, for example, the box shadow detect in, um, in Modernizer simply determines whether or not the, uh, a, deep, a newly created div has uh, the box shadow property on its style object, which is normally it's a decent indication that they've implemented it, it should work. Not entirely correct. Um, some versions of the Amazon Silk browser, browser on, on Kindles uh, supports the box shadow property, but just doesn't do anything. So there's absolutely nothing we can do to, to detect that. Okay? Um, other properties which actually change your layout, you can detect. Okay? So things like Flexbox, we don't need to because actually the um, browsers are pretty reliable about providing the right APIs when, they, when they've implemented it. But, um, but obviously that, makes, that does cause quite a major difference to the layout. So we would then be able to detect, detect whether or not it's had an effect on the layout. Um, form UIs is a really common thing. So um, with HTML5, there are all the, all, a whole, whole new load of form input types. You've got things like dates, times, um, sliders, and number inputs, and things like that. Um, there's no real way to detect whether or not those things have UIs and whether or not they have decent UIs is the other thing. Because, let's, to be honest, the, the original set that Chrome put out were rubbish. Um, so, because these things are presented as a, a layer on top of the document when you click into the box, we have no way of knowing if there's a if there's a UI there or if it's just a box. Again, we could resort to heuristics, but that's going to go wrong very, very quickly. Um, ideally, we don't want it to take any user inter user interaction, particularly if we're talking about modernizer, which we're running in the head of a document before the page is even loaded. Um, there are certain events people wanted to know whether the DOM content DOM content loaded event is supported. Um, we can detect whether or not it's, it's defined within the window object, which is a bit of a start. If it's not, then the chances are it's not supported at all, it's not going to fire. 
However, we can't necessarily tell if it's going to fire at the right time um, without also taking control of the entire page and knowing when it should fire, which normally means breaking someone's app. So um, similarly, content editable. So this is a property um, that you can put on just about any element in HTML5, and it just makes it so you can change it, which is brilliant. Um, we can detect whether or not that property is supported, whether it's there, but we can't necessarily tell if it's doing the right thing once the user tries to do it. As I say there, yeah, we can quite often give accurate negatives, but not necessarily positives, which um, in some uses might be acceptable, but not others. Um, and there's also a matter of thinking about kind of older browsers and devices. So um, window.performance is a, is a new spec. Um, it's implemented in Chrome, which basically um, it's, it's amazing. You, uh, you basically get like a kind of time <coughs> of how long it took to, to do the network requests, um, how long it took to do page renders, all this kind of stuff that you can access in JavaScript. Brilliant. However, older devices, we have no idea about them. So obviously we can, we can feature detect the performance API, but we can't, feature, we can't do a, an accurate feature detect for things like network performance using, using that pattern because it's a new API and not a browser support it. Touch screens, bloody hell. Um, <laughs> so, again, so the, the technique a lot of people use for detect, trying to detect a touch screen, I'll say, um, is looking to see if the touch um, events are supported in the browser. But that's a new API. Touch screens have been around since the 90s, and then they just emulated mouse events. So for any device, and in fact, probably the most recent device that didn't support any kind of touch APIs was um, the, basically most Nokia phones that came out last year don't support it. So obviously there are still quite a lot of those around. Um, again, that gives you a case where you can give some kind of good idea of a positive, but the negative case, you have no idea. Um, so, I said don't get me started, but I'm starting now. So, um, I had a big old rant, and a lot of people disagreed, but um, if you're interested in this, this stuff and, and why I'm kind of quite passionate about protecting touchscreens, I said earlier that it was kind of how I ended up getting involved in modernizer, so it's quite a big thing to me. Um, I wrote an article about it, um, and essentially all of the techniques that people try and use either use new, new APIs or it's heuristics. So the classic one, which I hope people are steering away from a little bit now, is assuming that basically using media queries to do a lovely responsive design so that you have like a nice and narrow mobile layout and a wider sort of tablet and um, desktop layout, um, assuming that the narrow layout means it's touch and the wider layout means it's mouse. Okay, um, you can Panasonic now, now do a tablet that's about that big. Okay, that's not a narrow device and it's entirely touch. Okay, um, it's things like that. So it's, it, that's a heuristic. You're just assuming that oh, I have a device which has a small screen and is touch, therefore small screen equals touch. Um, those things can trip you up very easily, and it might seem like a good idea at the time, but it's not in the future. Um, it sort of goes for many device features. Media queries are start, going to start to give us more information about this. In fact, there's, there's a new media query, which is media query, uh, which is for pointer, which can either have a coarse value or a fine value, which actually tells you whether it's someone stabbing at it with a, you know, presumably a thumb, but it might not be. Um, and then there's also a, a hover uh, media query, which tells you whether or not it's hover capable. So these are kind of steps forward in the right directions because they're. What I love about them is they're not saying, you know, are you touch? They're saying, do you have a fine pointer or do you have a coarse pointer? And do you support hover and do you not support hover? Because touch doesn't necessarily mean no hover as well. The new um, the Samsung Ga Galaxy S4, as a device, has a touch screen that supports hover. Um, iPhones, uh, Safari browser, it takes the hover state in your CSS on your first tap. Yes, okay, so that, that, I guess that's a grey area because um, <coughs> that's, that's essentially emulating, that's emulating hover rather than necessarily having hover as a capability of the input device. Oh yeah, but what, what, what would that report to the JavaScript though if you were... Well, it completely yeah. depends how you're, to, how you're trying to detect it. As, as I see, say, these things are very tough to detect. In terms of, um, in terms of hover for, for the media query, that would be no hover because, right. um, because it's based the media query is based on information given to them by the operating system. Um, yeah, 
So the spec specifically says that um, the emulated hover events shouldn't be shouldn't be the most capable of yeah. emulated hover events shouldn't, shouldn't be reported as such. Um, because that, that's, that was put in not to be a team, <coughs> but to get around the fact that loads of people would make drop, drop down menus that require hover and things like that. Um, so that's kind of an interesting space. Uh, we had a big old discussion on, on Modernizer about having a, um, a detect for a mouse, was how it was put, um, which instantly kind of put my back up a little bit because um, detecting a mouse isn't very useful. What we want to know is whether or not it's a fine point, we want to know whether or not it can, whether or not it's hard capable. I think breaking devices down into their capabilities, again, rather than just saying, is it this device, is it that device? It's, that's kind of the equivalent to what, we've, what we're doing with browser features, right? So with browser features, we've been saying, you know, do you support geolocation, do you do this? Rather than, are you IEA, are you Chrome, are you Firefox? And I see that as the same thing, so. Um, right, yeah, this is kind of where I was going to start talking about this capabilities idea where we stop kind of thinking in terms of right, what, what device have I got, what, what input device have I got, what output device have I got, and just try and think of things in terms of the capabilities it offers. Um, I was actually going to throw in a table here, which is, so how many of you use caniuse.com? Yeah, so most of you have seen that site. So it's basically just a big list of got all the browsers along the top, um, a load of browser features down the side, and then it kind of, kind of says yes, yes, no, or partial, depending on whether or not those browsers support those things. Now, I see input devices and output, output devices in the same way. I think, I think they can be viewed in the same way. So again, you have different input devices across the top. So that might be a, touch, a single touch screen, a multi-touch screen, a mouse, a keyboard, a two-button mouse, a trackpad, all these different things. And then you have the capabilities down the side. And the capabilities are things like being able to interact, <coughs> being able to do a primary interact, <coughs> being able to hover, having course pointing of it capability, which is obviously what mice and um, touch input do, and um, stylus and things like that. But um, keyboard can't hover, and can't, can't point, and things like that. So basically, you can produce this table with the same sorts of things. And I think the next steps then are to then work out, in the same way that for all the things in Can I Use, we're trying to make feature detect in Modernizer, can we do capability detects for these capabilities of input devices that we can then start saying, my feature that I'm building here depends on these certain input capabilities. Um, I, I think that's kind of where things, where I want to see things going, and there will, we'll need, we will need new browser APIs for these things. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of, that would be a much better way to go than people still just kind of pushing themselves against, oh, I've got this device, I've got that device, I've got that device. It becomes much more future-proof and much more flexible. Um, so that's all hand -waving. Um So just to kind of wrap up, really, I have no idea how long I'm taking. Um, that's right. That's um, right. So just in terms of managing cases, Compatibility. I've kind of said, you know, I, I, I think it's great if we can start thinking of our the things we build in terms of a, a, a series of separate features, and each of those features have their own the capabilities of the browser and the device they require. They also have capabilities of the user that they require, and that kind of becomes a statement of accessibility. You know, are you assuming that the user will be able to see this or will be able to hear this um, from their browser? Um, and I think considering this stuff right at the start of the project is really, really important. Okay, so to me, the variability and the, the differences between different devices, uh, different users, and different browsers is what the web is, right? It's the thing that makes web software different from any other kind of software is the fact that you've got such a broad range of target platforms that you're developing for, which makes it really, really interesting, but also makes it really difficult. Um, and embracing this stuff right at the start of your project rather than have, seeing it as a, oh, should I've got to test some of these browsers at the end of it kind of approach, I think is, will pay dividends and will also make us a bit happier if we just kind of get involved in this and really, really sort of uh, take it on. So, I mean, I, I've started on my projects when I start planning them 
I start picking out the features and saying what what are my ca what capabilities am I depending on for these different features. And just a sort of few, you know, rough ideas of things that might be able to help us in the future. How many of you have used Require.js? Okay, so Require.js is um, it's a dependency uh, management library. So essentially, you define. Um, I was talking, I mentioned earlier that uh, Modernizer has moved to, a, to AMD module format. So they look something like this. They actually say require rather than browser require. This is kind of my version. But you, you basically list your software dependencies for a particular module, and then require.js will trace it all through, stack it all together, and make it all work, and make sure that for the modules that you're using in a particular particular system, you have all the, you have all the dependencies there. And if a dependency isn't available, then that won't be compiled in, and it won't run. So this is just kind of something I, I was thinking about the other day. Could we have a browser required where we, we rather than de describing our dependencies on other bits of software, if we describe our dependencies on <coughs> browser capabilities or even device capabilities, even user capabilities, if we've got a way of the user saying, you know, this is what I can do or these are my interests. I mean, there's so many kind of different things that you can bring in there. Um, and again, these things will only run if those capabilities are available. So I've, I've kind of called that browser require, and maybe, you know, that's, maybe that's a, a project I might start work on. Or another version would actually be having it, tying it in with require, which has, its, has a, a module system. So we can have a normal require module, um, normal AMD module, where, say, jQuery was one of our software dependencies, but then we also have these, these modernizer dependencies, and they would run, build in and run the necessary modernizer tests, and then only run this bit of code if the capabilities are there. I sort of hope that, that that might be a thing at some point, I might start working on that, but anyway, that's a lot. Okay, cheers.